hi everybody russ from i hammers 11 hope you're safe and well if you're new to the channel please consider subscribing and hitting the bell icon so you made it anytime we put new content on today's guest um actually i should probably change our logo let's change our logo there we go yeah <laughs> john Matowski, you'd have known him um very well um we've become very good friends over the last uh few months really since lockdown really um john looks after the supports the uh the iron supporting food banks group which we'll talk about in a bit um but until then how are you john i'm all good russ really good uh healthy that's the main thing but uh really got to thank you um a lot for inviting me on to um my hams 11 of course i'm gonna put we'll put the uh, we'll put it all on there today so we've got the got the just giving site um so obviously um for the last few weeks me and john have been doing um have been working together on the uh the sort of the the game shows and stuff like that and um obviously in this weird time we're in at the moment um the stuff that the stuff that you guys are doing is is crucial more than ever to be fair isn't it yeah yeah when you think back that um the last game we played was uh, the end of uh, February and until last week we've not been able to provide a single can uh, to the food bank uh, by ourselves. Uh, that's starting to change now where we've got some access to um, sort of frozen foods from um, a large warehouse in Liverpool so um, we're able now to supply really decent quantities down into um, that new food bank uh, and also to other local food banks in, um, in Ilford and so on. And also, obviously, the, the fundraising has been tremendous. Uh, I've got to thank you, Russ, again for, for what you've done for the last five weeks or so in um, you know, promoting what we're doing and uh, getting to the amazing amounts that uh, we've received to date. Yeah, definitely. I mean, how, how did it all start, John, with the Iron Supporting Food Banks for you? Uh, for me, it was a couple of years ago um, when we played the opening game um, at Anfield on that Sunday. Uh, mm. I think it was Pellegrini's first game. Yeah. And I went along and saw that um, fans supporting food banks were already active. Uh, they'd been going four years by that time. And it was just incredible to stand there and see that they had a van and people would come in. Roy Evans, the manager, came as well with bags of food. And it was so well established. And I, thought, I had this moment, I thought, well, you know, we've got over a million fans coming to, to our stadium over a season. And just a small percentage of that. Uh, it would make a massive difference uh, mm. to Newham. So I started making inquiries, came across Newham Food Bank, and um, we put plans in place. And uh, it was probably the back end of a year ago or so when we were able to talk with um, the various authorities that mm. operate on site. And at first it was through the council uh, at Newham, and they said, oh, well, um, we don't operate this side. You, you, need to be, you need to speak to Lendlease because we wanted to be on Endeavour Square. So uh, when I phoned them, well, I sent them an email first, never got a reply. So um, I phoned up later and said, look, I need to speak to someone about putting up uh, a collection point. And they said, well, unless you give us a name, we, we can't put you through. And I thought, right, well, look, you've got an unanswered email from me. Yeah, but if you don't give me a name we need to speak to, we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, crumbs, you know, where are we going? Anyway, eventually I did get a reply from someone. And when I told them where we wanted to collect, they said, well, it's not us, actually. Uh, you need to speak to LLDC because mm. um, we'd actually moved the site by then to near where the um, information centre is on the main walk from Westfield to, um, to the stadium. Mm. So LLDC, they were brilliant. Uh, they really were. They said, yeah, we'll support you. We're happy to go through um, some plans with you about what you can do, what you can't. And then they said, well, of course, you realise that... Um, it's LS185 that actually operates the site on, on match days, not us. Right, okay, so then I got in touch with them and they said, yeah, okay, we're happy to support you. Uh, need a health and safety assessment for all your volunteers and you need to wear high vis and all the rest. So they said to us, okay, uh, we'll give you a, a trial go, which was the Leicester game, um, Boxing Day, I think it was, uh, or just certainly between Christmas and New Year. Anyway, it was fantastic. Uh, Newham Food Bank turned up. They brought three or four volunteers. Uh, we had three or four there as well. And we collected some, well, over £500 on day in cash. Uh, we just weren't expecting cash donations. We were looking for food and fair to The club promoted us as well on that day. And, and you know, they mentioned that we'd be there and collecting. And uh, Net Police contacted us and said, we're coming. Um, 
how big's your van? <laughs> and so they turned up uh, with a massive collection full of food and carrier bags, wow. about a dozen bobbies that all came and said, you know, we're with you on it. And then the next game, the club came, uh, and they came along with a dozen bags that they'd had a collection around, uh, amongst the staff at the club. And certainly after the first game, they said, yeah, that's good. You're okay with it. Subject to any um, high-risk matches. Mm. Well, you know, we had West Brom in the cup to come and got knocked out after us, and there were no big derbies left. So we basically ran it until um, until the end of Feb, and yeah, we started yeah. to build up a good rapport. We had regular visitors coming, uh, dropping off bags of donations, and we start to get to know them a bit more. And we were averaging about 700 quid's worth per game of wow. um, value of food and cash donations. But because you don't realize this until you're there and you're standing there and you've got various people walking past it. Not, not everyone's going to the football match. Um, and I remember one middle-aged lady walked past and we just chatted and said, you're off to the game. Oh, no, she said, uh, I'm off to the um, uh, to um, oh, the, the swimming area. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I, she, she said, uh, well, I'm going to classes with Tom Daly. Uh, I think it's a great idea that you do, and I'm going to bring him out in future and then he can endorse you so it's all little things like this to to boost the the profile of, of what we were doing and it was going so well and then everton turned up uh, brought massive bags of toilet rolls uh, liverpool turned up and we played brighton in the league and we'd been contacted in the week by a brighton fan who had said look we don't have a football food bank in brighton but i'm going to bring some stuff from our family to you so there was yeah. that goodwill generated uh, Crystal Palace, they dropped a load of stuff off as well. Leicester did as well. So it was all starting to move. And then, of course, we hit the end of uh, or the beginning of March. Uh, the games were cancelled to, to the fans. And Dave Sullivan picked up on this as well. Uh, and he said, right, he said, I will cover you for the, the five games that you can't collect at. So he gave us £3,500 to the food bank, which was uh, you know, a great gesture. And really from then on, uh, it's been about raising the cash. Uh, we promoted the um, Newman's Food Bank uh, and had quite a few thousand pounds added to there. Then we set up our Just Giving. Uh, and as, as you've seen, I mean, as it stands now, I think we're on to 20,070 pounds, I think, as of today. And I spoke to the food bank today. I said, look, how are you fixed for, for food and so on? They said, yeah, we're, we're needing to buy stuff now. Uh, from our reserves, uh, donations are are dropping uh, for food, and they've only got the three places where you can drop off food now. Um, there's uh, Tesco at um, Galliard Reach, yep. um, the Astor at uh, Beckton, and uh, Waitrose at uh, Westfield. Uh, but because they're restricted with their own transport, they can't go to any more supermarkets to collect. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a bit of a problem that we're trying to resolve with them now. Yep. And hopefully there'll be some progress on that. Um, we've been very well supported by fans supporting food banks in, in Liverpool who started all this off. Uh, they now are supplying through football fans 30% of uh, Liverpool food bank requirements. And also Newcastle are very strong. They've raised £300,000 in three years for local food banks. So it's, um, it's gaining momentum all the time. Mm -hmm. Two Manchester clubs are on board now, Aston Villa. Um, there's Huddersfield Town, Leeds United, Sheffield United, uh, and more and more are coming on board. And um, you know the um, the well, demand is growing as well. So we've just got to be there for them. That's the thing. It's the demand more than anything, isn't it? It's great that the, the, the it's it's great in a way that obviously the football fans are getting on. But obviously it's tragic the fact that so many football fans have to get on because the demand the demand for it is 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 so. It's like I remember one a couple of weeks ago you tweeted and it was a Friday I think and they ran out of rice and stuff like yeah. that. It's 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 crazy and it's only it's still worse, the case. Isn't it? Yeah, it's still the case for us. They um, spoke to them today. They said we're short of tin meat, tin fish, small bags of rice. Uh, tin tomatoes uh, and tin soup because they're preparing for the winter and um, it's going to be a tough winter for us all. Yeah. It is, it is, it is. Uh, and I mean, obviously, uh, and, and you know, the, the fact that the Iron Point Food Bank's initiative isn't just necessary for the new room, as you said, you know, Ilford and stuff like that as well, and other sort of 
needed charities within the community isn't it really yeah yeah it's just growing it's incredible you know last week we had the facility to take a van load of frozen pizzas and clothes yeah. new clothes down to um uh, newham and to um to ilford uh and today uh, i've spoken to lou mccari's um homeless hostel that he runs in stoke and um we were taking um new clothes again bag loads of new clothes for the guys living there uh, and i've just had a message in the last hour or so to say um there's a shed load of frozen ben and jerry's ice creams plus frozen um sausages and frozen bread come and get it if you want it so i'm going to do a detour and load up the car with uh, with all drop all that and drop it off to to lose place and so it, it, you know and when we come down next week uh, next month when we do this again we can do it monthly uh, again we'll fill up the van with uh, whatever we can get and um, just keep it going it's mental it's crazy isn't it when you think about it but but i mean as you said i think was it did you say was it 10 pounds feeds can feed a person for three days on the days, yeah exactly so and it, it it's odd that the demand has grown so much this year at newham for example because they were supplying they were allowing people to come with vouchers to collect from them twice every six months mm. and they were giving every person two days amount of food then that went up to um, three visits and then it went up to three days and now it's presently they're giving food for seven days now for every person who's turning up at the food bank and they just can't turn anybody away no. it, it, it's just getting worse and worse yeah and as you said we're coming up to christmas now and winter and yeah. it doesn't like it doesn't like the end in sight in terms of covid and so yeah it's going to be um it's going to be a tough a tough winter for a lot of people and you know obviously you, you know every, and as we said you know when, when we when we did the started the, the sort of the, the just giving stuff you know it, it's tough for everyone we know that um you know people furloughed and lost their jobs and stuff but you know you got to think fucking hell you know when when someone's got to go to a food bank to to feed their family you know it, we're fortunate enough that you know i've got a cupboard full of food you know and i'm not going to waste away john to be honest at the moment <laughs> you know me and my friday kebabs um <laughs> but it's um yeah it's 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 horrible when you think there's going to be like kids out there and not just the food you've got to think your know, toys and stuff like that for christmas and you know i know collectively we're looking to do something as a sort of a west ham youtube community um to, to sort of to carry over christmas but uh it's um it's it's horrible when you think of it like that you, mm. you know, mm. into perspective um, yeah that, something else that's hard for new and particularly also is that whilst we've got lots of fans who um lived in the new area and moved out further into further east into essex but the community now in newham and um, when you speak 240 different languages and dialects in newham yeah, true, yeah. and the food bank is saying that they supply from six centers depending on each day of the week it's barking road um canning town uh, east ham and so on and the demands of the local people are different from one center to the next food wise mm. you know there are a particular kind of there are families with particular habits of eating and so on and they vary center by center so it's it's, it's such a variety of, of foods that they need and i suppose to some degree we tend to think you know of western food that we have but you know that's not all that they need out there no, you're right and obviously yeah traditionally the western food is probably a bit ch is, is cheaper as well isn't it because it's, it's it's made yeah. in bulk and stuff and you can go and buy you know got those how many tins of baked beans mm. or something but it but rice and, and chickpeas and things like that tend to be more expensive because they have to be mm. imported and stuff so yeah it's obviously the diversity of the of the of the community as well but um yeah wow i didn't think about how many different dialects and languages there are God, that's mental. But uh, anyway, we, we, we're carrying on as, as you know, as we sort of alluded to last week. We're, we're, we're going to keep the um, uh, we're going for a second series of the game that's shows, right. <laughs> but maybe that's not right. every week. Maybe every week, so that people could get sick of me. But every other week, we're going to try and do some stuff, and at least and things like this. Obviously, we're going to keep the promotion up, and obviously, the, as I said, the wider West Ham YouTube community. We hopefully, do something is sort of November time and stuff. We did originally try and tie it in for when the fans are going back, but obviously, we know that's not happening now. So um, it is what it is, and we ride with the punches, and off we go. We'll be, it just breeds more creativity, doesn't it? So um, yeah, exactly. So we'll do some stuff, a coordinated approach. Anyway, 
let's let's part the food bank stuff for the time being because I want to talk about John, John the West Ham fan. So obviously we know you from the Iron Supporting Food Banks and all the great stuff you do, and you know the, the articles you write in these are brown and stuff like that. But John the West Ham fan, I, I detect not much of a, of a Cockney accent from you, John. To be honest, how how did it start? Why are you a West Ham fan? Most importantly. I must, I must say I'm hurt. I thought I'd been uh, <laughs> cultivating a, an East End accent over the last few years, but all right, I haven't fooled you. No, I'm a Northerner. I was born in Chester, uh, live in Cheshire, and uh, why West Ham? Would be, the answer is Bobby Moore. Um, I started to get involved in football in the late '60s, and where I lived, it, it was either it was either United or Liverpool who yeah. kids mm-hmm. tended to follow. Uh, and in our house, we only we only really knew. Um, George Best, Bobby Charlton, and then of course Bobby Moore through the World Cup. And I think my mum at the time used to do the football pools. Um, and they used to send out these little brochures alongside about football when I would start to get involved and looked at the, the World Cup winning team. And you look around, Charlton's there and so on. But oh, hang on, West Ham got three players in, in, in the England team. They must be good. <laughs> you know, so that was part of it. But also, uh, I was told for my age. So um, I played in defence, so it had to be Bobby Moore, uh, and that's where it uh, where it came from. Yeah, and then obviously, you know, since since obviously the '66, do you remember your first game at Upton Park? How, how often did you get down to to to, to the bowling during those sort of earlier period? It wasn't as frequent. No, um, my, my very very first trip to the bowling was when I was down in London. Uh, we used to spend some holidays, my sister and I, with my grandparents in France. So we'd have uh, four hours in London between getting into Euston and getting in a train out of um, uh, Victoria Station to yeah. uh, to Dover. And my big sister was sat there reading the book, and I thought, well, four hours here. I'm going to go to West Ham just to see it and to be there. So I said to her, look, I'll see you before we go. Um, I'm going to get a cab. So <laughs> I went outside, stood in the cab. Jumped in the back and said, "Take me to West Ham football ground, please." And the cabbie says, "No, he says you better, you better take the underground, mate." So I thought, "All right, okay." First lesson in the big city. So I looked at the map and got there in the end. Um, yeah. Got to Upton Park and um, walking up Green Street, you see the floodlights, and you think it's just great just to be there. You know, there's no game on. It was midweek. We'd probably gone back. It's probably July time. And so I went to the ground and just looked around and. The big um, gates were open uh, on the corner of the West Stand and the uh, South Stand, the the South Bank at the time. And I sort of cautiously went in, approached it, and came across a young groundsman. And said, look, um, you know, I'm just passing through. This is my team. Any chance of a look around? He said, yeah, yeah, come on. So he took me down. We went in the dressing rooms. And at the time, I just remember that, that West Ham were very... Um, I can put it, they always try, were trying new things. And I remember they had a strip of AstroTurf that you, you that the players ran on from the tunnel onto the pitch. And yeah. it was quite a novelty, so I saw that. And the guy takes me into the dressing rooms. And you go into the home dressing room, there's a white bra hanging on, <laughs> on the clothes hanging. <laughs> What's going on? But uh, no, fair dues, he took me around. And I only wish I had a camera at the time. But that made it for me just to be given that tour. Um, but uh, first uh, time I'd seen them was in September 71 um, at Old Trafford and uh, we lost 4-2. Uh, I saw uh, Clyde Best score, um, Trevor Brooking scored. Of course, Best scored the hat-trick and including that mazy run that he, uh, where he beat us at the scoreboard end. But it was just a fantastic feeling to, to see the players in the flesh from the distance and, of course, see Bobby Moore. Uh, and then a year later, I went to Everton. Uh, we lost there 2-1. Uh, you can get a coach from, from Chester Town Hall for 50p to walk to either Anfield or to Goodison. Uh, and tickets were easy to come by. And I just went on there as a schoolboy and um, uh, saw us lose there. And I think the first trip uh, down to Upton Park was um, 75, I think. Uh, we played QPR and we drew 2-2. Bobby had just left. Uh, Kevin Locke was there, you know, who's going to be the next Bobby Moore. He yeah. scored that day, I remember. And I think it was in the standing area at the front of the, the West Stand, from what I remember. 
But uh, again, you know, it's, it's all chilling to be there and uh, you know, to actually experience it and be amongst your own for the first time. And it's one of those things, irrespective of the fact that you weren't from around these parts, as Nigel Khan would say, um, it, it doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter. And it's just, that's what I love about West Ham. It's like, it's just a sense of community. And even more so since starting the channel and, and doing, and obviously doing the, the game shows and stuff, you just realise how much everyone is pulling in the same direction. Um, and it's lovely. It's a sense of community. I don't think any other club has I, I think I, you know i think i might be slightly biased towards it but you know when you get emails from tottenham fans and arsenal fans and chelsea fans all who watch the channel because they don't have that sense of that sense of community and the fact that yeah. you know that you're not you're the first two games you mentioned we lost and it's like you know what i mean oh, that's so, it. yeah, yeah it's, not, that's... it's not about the result it's about you get used to it yeah it's special yeah. And you learn early on as well that, um, you know, the West Ham community is a special one. Uh, you know, being a Northern, not having daily access to what's going on, yeah. you, you become aware of the image that the club has, um, the way that the fans are, you know, how special they are, the East End fans, the loyal and, and so on. And as a Northern, that kind of makes you proud to know that you're supporting a team mm. with those beliefs and, and, yeah. and, and characteristics, let's say. Totally. But talking about, you know, um, fans from all over the place, we very often, coming down on the train from Cheshire, from Crewe, we're coming across um, uh, fans nearly all. We've got about 40, 40 on our WhatsApp group now from people who live in, from fans who live in Manchester, Liverpool, and very often on the tra same train back up north after a game. And then we've got um, Trans Pennine Irons with uh, yep. a couple of hundred members. So, um, you know, Liam keeps us informed with what's going on. And um, it's, again, that's another little community of, yeah. of Northerners following our team. Oh, it's mental. It's mental. It's like, as you said, you know, just by doing the, the donations thing, you know, we've we've had the Scandinavian hammers, the Singapore hammers, a lot of the American hammers. It's, um, it, you know, it's something which I think I didn't, I wasn't so aware of of how big our, our brand, not our brand, I'm sorry, so don't mean to say that's wrong, how our club is, how how the club is, you know, in internationally. You know, I was always maybe quite insular and quite Essex and London-based. But, you know, we've, we've, like as you said, not just the guys in the north, but even northern and the Scandinavian hammers, they're 800, 1,000 strong as a group, and the American hammers. And, you know, yeah. I've been fortunate enough to talk to the Indian hammers and, and the, it's the Singapore hammers. It's... um. It's an amazing place. It's an amazing club. It really, really is. You know, the fan base is just second to none. Um, and and as you and we've seen, you know, firsthand, you know, the the support that they 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 give. They give them the food banks. You yeah. Know, particularly yeah, guys. Awesome. You know, when I think of like the Singapore Hammers, they don't live. They don't live near here. You know what I mean? You know, and, and it's for a charity that's not going to directly affect them. It's it's going to an area which they might never have been to. Do you know what I mean? But um, yeah. because it's West Ham, they, 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 they sort of support that. And it's, it's amazing. Very humbling. It's very humbling when that happens. Um, I don't know. It's just like, yeah, it makes you feel warm inside. It's nice. You know, there's so much crap going on in the world. Um, it's nice that you, you, we, we could, we could do that and, and, and make a difference. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, we get all sentimental. I haven't had a drink. <laughs> it's like a, it's like friday night at a pub and i'm just walking out i love you guys but uh, no it's all good it's all good um right let, let's let's go and talk about your 11 uh john because your hammer's 11 because obviously early 70s onwards you've got a nice spread you've got a nice yeah. spread of people to pick from the only rule is you have to be alive to a scene and play but to be perfectly honest john you've probably been alive to see most of most of what i call the, the modern greats so I'm looking forward to sort of a classic 11 for you. Today. Yeah, you're choosing your words pleasure. very carefully there, Russ. I, I like that. <laughs> I, say you, I say you're an experienced fan, John. That's what I call them, the experienced and the unexperienced fan. Okay. And you are very much an experienced fan. So as a, you can play any formation you want, anything yeah. you want. Uh, the only rule is you have to be alive to a scene and play. And that's it. That's it. So um, I, I imagine, as I said, more of a classic eleven for you. I think some old, some old heads and a few maybe youngsters. I don't know. Oh, I don't know where yeah, you're going to go. Yeah, yeah. that's something yeah, quite interesting. All right. You can see right, my team sheet here. Then. Yeah, you got your team sheet ready. All right, they're yeah, starting yeah. goal. They're starting goal, oh, then, John. Uh, 
Ludo was very, very close, I've got to say. Uh, I did admire Ludo. I did see him play. Um, one of my worst um, games to watch was at Tranmere Rovers, where we lost 5 2 on a Friday night. I think Aldridge was playing for Tranmere at the time. Ludo was in goal. And I thought, oh, crumbs, you know. Luckily, I only lived about 10 miles down the road at the time. So <laughs> it wasn't too bad. But sorry, sorry, Ludo. Uh, you'd be on, on the bench if that's any. Um, any benefit but it's got to be phil parks it has to be phil i mean I remember when we signed phil and um you just felt certainly at the time that um the first division was very much a level playing field really you know there were no foreign players you you, you knew who you were signing uh, and to sign phil as the most expensive goalkeeper in the world i felt well that's a statement of intent by west ham united my club and you feel really proud when you know they can they can make those signings like that because I, I think I read that um, Manchester United were looking to sign him as well, uh, but uh, he chose us and then gave us so many um, great memories. I mean that for me, his period at the club was was my ideal time. We did yeah. so well, not always in Division One, but yeah. the cup runs, Europe, um, the togetherness of the team. Um, and so many English players um, in that, you know, with maybe one or two exceptions at, at the time. But, uh, yeah, you, you always knew that we had a chance with, with big filling goals. So, yeah, yeah. Phil's my number one. Yeah, great, great shout. Uh, and a lovely bloke as well. Um, right, OK, Phil is in. Uh, uh, what, what formation are we playing, John? 4-4-2. Uh, oh, classic. I like it. OK, let's go left back then. Who have we got on the left? That's uh, got to be Frank Lampard. Yeah, it's got to be. I mean, you know, Frank was the proper East Ender. Uh, you could see how he related to the crowd. You know, he was he was one of the fans. Um, I'd seen him play a few times. The game I didn't see him play live was obviously the the winning goal in the FA Cup semi final against Everton when he did the corner flag jig, mm. which I think he would be remembered for. But again, you know, he became an in, in England international. Um, he was solid and um and dependable uh, the, the time i felt sorry for him was when we played in the um 76 uh cup winners cup final when i think he got injured in the first half uh, and anderlecht scored um and i just remember he you know he was injured in that game and i think that affected the team um because before that certainly in the first half we couldn't have got a count but uh, i think his injury at that time um shook us and obviously we lost the game yeah, and I think we've and I've said it before. I think when we, when, we, when we talk about when we talk about the greats, um, the West Ham greats, Lam, Lampard's always never in the in the wash. It seems you know what I mean. It's always more Peter's Hurst and uh, and Billy Bonds and and, and uh, doing this channel. I just think that you know we don't. He doesn't get the accolades that, that he deserves, and obviously you know part of the reason is because of his his son and everything that went on before, you know, with, with Harry and stuff. But I just think he, he deserves so much more recognition within the club. Um, yeah, as, as a player, he, he was one of our Mr. Dependables. Yeah. You know, how many games have he played? Um, 600 and something. I'll tell you now, because I've got it written down here. Um, yeah, 660. Wow. Including the Cubs. So, um, yeah, uh, always a pleasure just... to see him there. Yeah, it just seems that it just yeah. Like I said it's always, I, I, I you know I just think it's it's a tragedy really when someone you know you, you know you think how how much Billy's revered and, and Bobby and stuff like that and you know he he was I think he was second is he second all time appearance holder after Billy I thought something like that he's up one of he's up the top three I Close, think, yeah 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 it's um but anyway anyway he's in your team that's the main yeah. thing John. Right, okay, let's go to the other side. Let's go to the right back. Who is your ever right back? Oh, it's got to be Tonka. Yeah. Really, you know, Ray Stewart. Um, I remember when we signed him, and again, I think he was the most expensive teenager at the time when we signed him from Scotland. Yeah. And uh, there he was. I think he went into the team after a couple of months. And another Mr. Dependable mm. um, from the penalty spot as well. Um, I saw him miss his first penalty. Um, we were playing at, uh, it was in Division 2, I think, at uh, Luton Town. Um, and it was, um, 
it was 29th of February 1980. I remember that date specifically. And um, we got a penalty. He shot. The guard, he saved it, but he got the rebound. So yeah. uh, <laughs> that's great. And again, that that team from 1980 and so on was just magical. Really, really was. It was such a togetherness. And um, I met him three times. Um, the first time was a book signing at uh, Upton Park. There was, I think it was the boys of 86. He was there signing. And I said to him, look, we signed this for my nephew in Scotland, um, Peter Rotomsky. And he was struggling with my surname. And he, and he, he, he said, I can't write it. I'm really sorry. Uh, I'll just have to put his first name. And he wrote Andy. And I think he was perhaps signing Andy to everyone. You know, I don't know, but uh, that's the way he was. And then um, I think he did one of those uh, dinners, um, yeah. Friday night dinners as well with, with Sir Trevor uh, when he brought the FA Cup last season. And I got the picture taken with him. And uh, even then I still couldn't understand what he was saying. And he still can't understand but, really. Yeah, but what a, what a penalty taker. And, yeah. um, you know, again, solid, uh, solid defender. And again, as you said, you can't understand a word he's saying, but he's just a really, really nice bloke, you know. And that's uh, and there's, I think, all that sort of era, all those players are just nice blokes as well. So it's like, you know, I, I've been obviously very fortunate enough to interview a lot of them recently. And I mean, Ray, bless him, we haven't got him on the channel yet. He'll be on the channel soon, but we've got to do it when we can do it face to face because he doesn't like doing all this. Oh, all right, this okay. Zoom, all this Zoom yeah. stuff, bless him. Yeah, we'll get um, the subtitles on then. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, I don't know how I'm gonna do that one, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> but bless him, he phoned me to say I'm not ignoring you, Russ, and you know, told me the reasons. I was like, oh, don't worry. And and then we must have talked talk about West Ham for about an hour and a half. I've never met the man before, um, but he gave me an hour and a half of his time. And uh, then he said, oh, actually, Russ, I've got to go now because my tea bags have just dried on the drying line. So um, <laughs> it's obviously his stock line to leave every phone call. Yeah, but, um, yeah, yeah. Made me yeah, feel we know it's like. All right, we'll put, we'll put Ray and put Tonks in. All right, we'll go centre-back. So who's your first centre-back? Uh, stretch, Alvin. Yeah. yeah, he's got to be there. I mean, again, he's done, he's done the years with the club. Uh, loyal, loyal servant, England international. Um, yeah, another one of the, the Mr. West Ham dependables. Um, again, I think he played nearly 600 games too. Something like that, yeah. Um, I saw him in his first season that played at Old Trafford. It was the season he went down and he was quite raw then. He'd only just made the team, I think perhaps through injury. And we played again at Manchester United. We lost 2 0. I remember the second goal was a penalty that uh, he let uh, Stuart Pearson get away from him and grabbed him and pulled him down in the box. And uh, we lost that one 2 0. I'm, I'm sure they spoke about that later on when um, Pancho signed yeah. for us. But he, he was very raw. But even then, you know, they talked about him. Uh, and there he is, you know, 10 years or so later, uh, still at the club, plus the. You know, the hat trick he got and, and against Newcastle and all the rest. And um, that's gone down in folklore. Yeah. And again, you know, he's just, you know, he just, he, again, not necessarily wrapped from around these parts, but, um, you know, he's very much an adopted Cockney, um, still lives in the area. Um, and, you know, nowadays, you know, you look at, you know, obviously, Mr. Noble and stuff, and how much, how many times, how many games he's played for us, and how long he's been at the club. You know, Alvin, double testimonial, you know, and I think, you know, it's just, I just think he's brilliant. And, um, and yeah, no, it's just, it's not much more you can say about him, is it? Again, he's yeah, another exactly. one who needs to be revered. And obviously, seeing the, seeing him and David, and obviously David being there, it's, it's nice because, you know, you can see that Alvin's living. You know, not only is his son playing Premier League football, obviously that Chelsea game famously, but with um, it's his son as well, and it's his club as well. It's like it just makes you feel warm inside knowing that. But uh, we'll put Stretch in, uh, and who's Stretch going to partner? In oh league? well, Sir Bobby. Yeah, Sir Bobby. Glad I've seen him play twice. Well, wow. and uh, what else can you say about the man? You know, he could have been better looked after towards the end. But um, what an ambassador and the way he carried himself. Yeah. And uh, I did get the chance to meet him um, one time um, in the mid-80s. Um, my old mum used to do the work in the boardroom at uh, Chester Football Club where we lived, and she used to do the teas in, say, in the boardroom. And 
after a while she said look you want to come along and uh, watch the game so i said yeah and i was still a schoolboy then and i ended up going from being the ball boy to running out running the dressing rooms during the game so i was the one that put the plug in turn the taps to the big bass and all the rest and i did that for 17 years and uh, saw some top teams turn up these newcastle in cup games watford came with elton john and all the rest and then in the 80s of course bobby had gone on to manage south end united for a while yeah. and uh, it just hadn't clicked with me I, again there just wasn't the information that was flowing around in, in you know no internet uh, you just didn't realize and um so Bobby was there with, with South End, and it was the back end of the season, a couple of games left. And um, it was second half was just starting of the game. And I used to have to rinse the teacups. And I always did the away uh, dressing rooms first. And I walked up the corridor, and who comes out of the away dressing room but Bobby? And wow. I'd never seen him so close. The man was immense, he was a giant. Uh, he was wearing this green track so just and he had a certain way of walking didn't he you know yeah. he was very distinguished and he's walking down towards me there's nobody else in the corridor i'm walking towards him and my mouth just dried up and i just couldn't say to him bobby you're the reason why i support west ham and i, I couldn't get a word out just yeah. as he he went past me he kind of winked and grinned and i thought okay that will do for me yeah, uh, we yeah. never spoke, but at least he acknowledged me, and uh, you know that's one of my memories. Wow! But, uh, I wish I could have been different. But even that itself was uh, was special for me. It was enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What fantastic memory! It's like as you said, so fortunate to to have well met the man and you know cross paths with him. You know, it's a uh, yeah, literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Okay, we'll put Sir Bobby in. Right. Okay, let's go into midfield. Um, right. Let's go. Let's go left midfield, left wing. Who have we got on the left? uh left wing oh, alan devonshire yeah alan for me uh incredible um again i was glad to see him play um when west ham played in the northwest it was very much easier for me to get to games of course yeah um, we used to see him at tranmere the manchester clubs in liverpool and blackburn and so on and he we played a few times at, at wrexham in uh, the old second division and for me he scored one day the best goal I've ever seen in the flesh. Um, I think we, sure we didn't lose, but it was um, Phil Parks got the ball, threw it out to, to Devo, who was in his own half on the left wing, and he then starts to run towards the Wrexham goal. And we were all behind the goal in the upper tier in, in at the Wrexham end, and he starts weaving towards us. And we're all shouting, go on, go on, keep going. And he beats two defenders, uh, then gets into the box, beats another two. Di Davis was in goal and slipped it in the net. We just went ballistic at the West Ham. It's fantastic. Uh, best goal, as I say, I've seen it. it if, if you haven't seen it, it's similar to the one that Payet scored in the cup at oh, wow. uh, Blackburn that time, you know, when he ran the full length of the yeah, pitch yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, dribbled around it. It was a similar goal to that. And uh, that was just a fantastic moment to see that. Oh, brilliant! And 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 you know what? Uh, again, you know, it's really, it's really sort of saying that you know, saying repeating myself, but he's just a top bloke, absolute top bloke. Yeah. You know what I mean, it's like yeah. really fortunate enough to to spend some time with him, and you know, and, and again, that's like all of these lot, all these generation. You know, when they when you chat to them, it's like. It's like you're their best mate, you know. What I mean, it's like it's like you know, and it's it's so genuine when you talk to them. It's not like you feel that they're they're talking to you for talking to you's sake because you know you've you've asked for you know. As I said, me and me and Dev must have chatted for about an hour before and an hour after the our episode, just putting the world of football to right, and it's just amazing. And he couldn't work out how to do this, how to do all this, but um, his wife had to do it. But uh, still, he's a, a top bloke, and um, you know, he has to be put down as one of the greatest transfers ever in English mm. football. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, just into what would he be worth in today's money? Do you know what I mean? You know, it's, it's, it's yeah, you couldn't get the ball off his feet at all. It was yeah. just, it was as if it was a magnet and uh, it was great to see those major dribbles and, uh, yeah. you know, he looks so light as well. I don't know how tall he is, but certainly he was very slight in build, but mm. it didn't work against him. 
No, 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 exactly. Right, Devo is in. Let, let's let's go right right midfield. Let's go the other side. Right, Who's okay. The side? Um, I've got their um, oh, Dimitri Payet. Yeah. Of course, I had to go with him. Um, you know, not not a classic from years gone by, but you know, when he signed for us, we were living the dream when we saw what he could do. I remember his his first game. I saw was at um, Southend United in a pre-season yes, friendly. friendly and I remember seeing him he got his first touch and he started going on this major run and I think all of us fans saw what skills he had even then and thought wow if he can do this in the Premier League we've got a winner here uh, and I think even in that game he, he might have been he might have scored with with one of his famous free kicks in that I think, I think I'm so, not yeah. sure I think but uh, after that game, we were all thinking, wow, what have we got here? Yeah. And then, of course, you know, for that season, we, we were all living the dream. The song, the free kicks, you know, the one at, um, the one at Crystal Palace uh, where, he, where he shot into the, the Trevor Brooking stand, where it just dipped at the last second. Everyone thought it was going over. Yeah, and uh, there it went, dipped in. And then the one at Old Trafford in the Cup, that one that no one expected and uh in his last season the major run at home against i think it was middlesbrough yeah, yeah, yeah. picked up the ball on the touchline and just that major run and uh it's just a shame that he, he couldn't hang on with us but you know there are reasons there that we'll, we'll never know i guess yeah but i mean he's he's he doesn't very rarely in particularly in modern west ham history that we have a player who we sign at the right time. Do you know what I mean? We yeah. always seem to get players who are bookending their career, whether they yeah. just, or, you know, we, we get, you know, Jeremy Ngakia or we get Teddy Sheringham. You know, we never get sort of ones who are in their plum. And, you know, to all accounts, obviously he's still playing fantastically in Marseille. But yeah. that, that sort of two, that season half, he was, he was bang on. And um, he was, he was the man, wasn't he? Every club wanted him. All yeah. my friends who were not West Ham fans were desperate that, to have him. And actually, someone sent me a, an Instagram like story the other day. I'm going to find it. And it's something like he has the most, he has the most, um, like it still has the most assists in the Premier League or something ridiculous. It was like 900 and something. I'm going to have to find it now because it's going to really annoy me. Well, typically, ah. I'm going to find it now. But it was something. It was like a stat, and it was he, they, he was top of something of of, of mm. the chances created in the last decade or something like that. And and he was top, and um, he was just a, he was, you know, I don't think I will, personally I'll ever see a Ballon d'Or nominee wear a West Ham shirt. Yeah, again, exactly. you know what I mean? It's, yeah, you never know. I'll say never. You never know. But um, I just think it was it was you said it was it, everything. It doesn't happen at all for West Ham that the stars aligned. And that season, the stars just all aligned with the right player, the right manager. And it was the last season and it just all worked well. You know, yeah. you could have a couple more wins and we would have obviously got into Europe, Champions League, whatever. But it was it was just a perfect season, you know, a fantastic season to see off the old girl. Um, and it, it helped him get back in the French national team as well with the performances. Yeah, I mean, you know, he yeah, used us as a stepping stone for the right reason, I would say. Mm, but yeah. it was a fantastic time when he was there. I yeah, was so yeah. sad to see him go. Yeah, yeah, I was as well. But and you sort of get that with those mercurial players, don't you? You know, the sort of their sort of throw their toys out the pram and. You know, and, and again, that's how he he joined us, doing the same thing. He, he you know, he, he went on strike in Marseille, to, and they opened him, welcomed him back with open arms. You know, that's how much of they revered him. But um, yeah, yeah, Dimmy Pyatt's in. Okay, let's go central midfield. Who's your first central midfielder? I'll be interested about this. Really, mm. Billy Barnes. Yeah, got to be really. What a man, you know, Mister West Ham. Mr. Reliable, Mr. Fitness, you know, playing till he was 42, I think, or nearly yeah, 42. Yeah, 41, you know, something like that. I'm sure. But, you know, what can you say? You can just carry on talking and talking. But such a gent as well, you know. Um, he seems to be a quiet man. Um, quiet. But I remember seeing the 1980 um, Cup team um, at a West Ham evening a year or two ago, and he was 
he was on there and they were all telling stories about each other and you could see the the togetherness of of, of that group of players from you know, 1980 and a couple of years before and after and so on it was it was fantastic to see and uh, i think you know we're lucky that we've had somebody like that um as part of west ham's history yeah no, i totally agree and obviously when when he had the stand named after him as well you know that was a incredibly emotional day that was and um and for a man who didn't show any emotion um I, I mean obviously i never saw him play i saw him manage and even when we went up in that 92 93 season he was excited but there wasn't like tears of joy like you know breaking down the tears like he did you know that newcastle game we named the stand after him mm. and um yeah it was uh again you know same you know obviously there was a period where the, he wasn't particularly well treated by the club um but they, they made right with that they made right with yeah. that and i think it yeah. was uh, well deserved and you can see the respect that the fans and the and his peers had with had for him because obviously that was they were all there which was beautiful um okay big bills in um who is he going to partner in that middle so trev it has to be again you know uh, i'm glad to have seen him play um i remember when he was making the his debuts in the team i think in the late eight late um late 60s i think and you know he was there and about all the time for so long and again like bill what else is there to say that he was so dependable again he had the skills uh there were the famous european knights in um in the 70s and uh it was great that he was a part of it and he made such a difference and you look at some of those old clips of the goals that he scored at upton park the amazing runs the shots and um time gone by but, but greatly remembered and uh, he's yeah. got to be in my life yeah and and again it's like something which I, I i never really probably thought about until starting to do this and obviously because people mention players and i go and do a little bit not research afterwards but i'll go and look at the old footage you know i i, f I think people forget how crap the pitches were as well and you had yeah. like people like dev people like brookin and they talk about how elegant the players are and how they glide past players they were doing this on like minefields you know complete yeah. bogs yeah. of pitches yeah um and again you know could you imagine someone like dev on the bowling green of london stadiums you know like you know what what could they do but interestingly the vice versa i'd love to see messi having a go at that stamford bridge pitch when we bomb four oh. nil you know what i mean all the like more yeah. sand than grass but um yeah it's incredible when you think about it um uh particularly nowadays and obviously the you know the, the balls were different were, were heavier and the boots you know there weren't these sort of you know light as a feather things they're all sort of quite clumpy and mm, still yeah, producing yeah. beautiful beautiful football um right we'll put sir trev in up front who's your first who's your first forward then john first one for me again because i was lucky enough to see him play so often was a psycho david cross yeah um you know for me i, I think personally for me it was great to see a hard northerner playing in the west ham team you know certainly when West Ham used to play up north. I remember seeing him play at Manchester City. And, uh, yeah, it was great to see that, you know, we had someone who could dish it out as well. And, obviously, his performance in the cup final. Um, and, you know, as you just mentioned now, the 4-0. Yeah. And um, the other thing is it's uh, it's 40 years today since he scored the hat-trick against Castilla uh, in the cup. That was the uh, that was the one played behind closed doors, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, that's the anniversary today, apparently. Oh wow! Was that our biggest European victory ever? I think or something. Uh, aggregate? Was it, was it five one after all? I can't remember what it was. But uh, it was a five one. I think it was. Yeah. 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 I think it was our but highest the, ever. But the first of so many cracking games during that season in Europe. Yeah, you know, the one against the Germans and so on, and then we were down, and then I think it was the Dutch, and it was just a shame to lose against Anderlecht in, in those circumstances. We gave them a good go, but uh, you know, again, it wasn't to be. Yeah, and, and you know, I think, and 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 obviously we've interviewed Crossy, and 
he um, he he attributes all of his success to what's the West Ham fans. That's what he says. He's like, I you know, I, when I turned up, I didn't think I was going to be good enough, and the fans gave me so much confidence that you know he was always always felt like he had to repay the fans because um, they they made him uh, the player he was. And I was like, oh, bless him. Yeah, him. and he played for something like seven or eight clubs. Yeah. I didn't realise that he plays most of his games with us. Because he was such a journeyman with West Brom and Coventry and where, wherever else. I mean, he started off at Rochdale. But, yeah, most of his uh, games were with West Ham. Yeah, exactly. All right, Psycho, the original Psycho. Um, yeah. And who's the last person, John? Who's the last? It's got to be Paolo. It has to be yeah. Paolo Di Canio. You know, again, I was glad to see him play, some of the trickery. Um, <laughs> he... You know, he made that dressing room as well in some ways with the way he was so unpredictable. Um, I remember seeing him play. Um, he beat Leicester City, he scored the winner uh, at home. And then, of course, the season we went down, he scored that goal against Chelsea at home right towards the end. And we, we felt we were close to having a chance of staying up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, I think Sky did a little documentary on him a week or two ago, just half hour of all of his goals. And it was just fantastic to see them again. You, you felt as if he'd, he'd just taken one touch too too much, or he was about to fall. But the way he was able to get his foot round the round the ball and, and score it back the net, it was it was incredible. And always I noticed that he always pulled his shirt up uh, to cover his round the back of his head. I think it was, but that was something we did all the time. But uh, oh, what a fantastic guy oh. uh, uh, and what a complex character. But you know, we got some good years out of Paolo. Oh, we did. We did. He was just like, what I loved about him, he was just like an, inter obviously we go to football to be entertained, don't we? Of course, we go yeah. to see fantastic skill and, and someone like Payet, I think Payet was the most technical gifted player I've ever seen at West Ham. But someone like Paolo, I always put him down as my favourite player because he had that that entertainment value. You know, you'd you would pay your season ticket just to see him, you know, and it's like you would turn up thinking, not, how West Ham going to do? What's Paolo going to do this week? Yeah, yeah, and it, and exactly. it, and it might yeah. be a bit of skill. It might be a, a tantrum. It might be, I don't know. Like I was watching that Bradford City game the other day again, oh, and, yeah. and 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 like him on the on the touch, is sitting on the floor, like you know, sub me, take me off, take me off. And then the song, and it was almost like he was re-energized, and he sort of like you know he grew and grew, and then he was ready ready to play, and um, oh, he's brilliant. And we've heard some some cracking stories about Paolo, you know, with fans when they've met him and stuff, and just how he's been with them, and he, he's just like you know, br he's just a brilliant person. And, you know, the fact that you know, I, I mean, I have utmost respect because he's got a t West Ham tattoo because I'm so phobic of needles. I, you know, I, I passed out on my BCG test, um, you know, so, so I, I hate needles. So anyone who's got a tattoo, I've got in higher regard and particularly to have a West Ham tattoo also for not being around these parts. Um, brilliant yeah, man. Of course. I think he's great. Yeah, absolutely. He just got the fans and they just got him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's we just, talked to uh, him. Yeah, really, really took to him. And, you know, as I said, you know, in the same way that, you know, we only got him because he pushed over a referee. Do you know? Yeah, <laughs> you know exactly. I mean? Harry like, took a punt, didn't he? he did. You know, he, he took a chance, yeah. And as, he, and, and as Harry's own omission when we interviewed him, he was he was unmanageable. Um, <laughs> he, he just didn't manage Paolo. He just let him just be. And uh, you just had that sense of him. But uh, some funny stories, uh, yeah. And also, you know, a bit like you start. I mean, you started with Phil Parks and the Cossack adverts, and you end with Paolo Di Canio and the Imperial Lever adverts. So there's, yeah. you know, there's there's a lineage there. But uh, John, man, it's been it's been lovely. It's been lovely. It's been good chatting, Russ. Really, it's been great. Yeah, it's been really, really good. And obviously, everyone, justgiving.com slash crowdfunding slash iron supporting food baits. Make sure you keep. Thank you. You know, Thanks. rather than you know, we're. Um, you know, the pubs are shut at 10 o'clock. So, you know, rather than that last pint, give it to someone else who could need it. And um, yeah. and obviously we'll still be doing the uh, the quiz shows and stuff like that as well to keep it, keep it momentum going. But uh, obviously thank you. thank you for everything you're doing, John. And um, that that's it for me and John. Uh, take care, everyone. Stay safe. That's very important at the moment. Uh, come on, you irons. And we'll come see you irons. again. Oh, oh, John goes for the, the, the top one, the top one. We'll do that one together. Come on, you irons. And we'll see you again very, very soon. Take care.